And just before we start, Joyce, I just, um, no, I'll hold off on that. I would know I want to focus on you being here because we this this is a frustrating week for all of us who are trying to get ahead of something like minimum wage when we're still on the floor and have many miles to go before we're done. So um, I appreciate you coming in and giving us kind of a um, a quick primer on S23, and I'm sure we'll have you back and when this information has context, have, have more questions on it. But I did want us to want the committee to start thinking about this bill, um, even though we're on the floor thinking about a bunch of different other things. So, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Joyce Van Chester from the Joint Fiscal Office, and it's a pleasure to talk about the minimum wage bill, S23. Um, so I'm going to talk about some notes, and these notes are in preparation for the fiscal note that should be forthcoming. Um, and I welcome your questions, because I know that there are lots of um, sometimes confusing ideas and, and uh, numbers and so forth. So please feel free to ask any questions as we go along. So I'm going to start with the current minimum wage in Vermont, which is $10.78. Now, that's a funny number. 78 is simply 1050 last year, indexed to inflation. Okay. So according to the current law, Vermont's minimum wage starts at 1050 and then is indexed to inflation every year. So um, according to the most recent consensus, economic consensus regarding inflation for coming years, you can see I've given you a little chart over on the right that shows you what we expect for inflation. So in 2018, it was 2.4%. In 2019, the consensus as of uh, early January was expecting 2.5%. That may turn out to be a little bit high, but we'll see. And then it settles down around 2.2, 2.3% in, in coming years. Now, if there's a recession at some future date, uh, those numbers could change, of course. So this is sort of the steady as she goes economy looking forward. So get the inflation idea in your head. It means that every year, a dollar is worth a little bit less, right? And if inflation is 2.4%, it means that a dollar today is worth about, uh, what, 97.6 cents, right? So it's, it's a little bit less. And, and if you want to think about a loaf of bread, a loaf of bread might cost, what, let's say $5, okay? But uh, if inflation continues, that price of a loaf of bread is going up every year because each dollar that you pay is worth a little bit less. Okay, So at a 2% inflation rate, uh, a loaf of bread that costs $5 this year will cost $5 and what, 10 cents? Yes, $5.10 next year. Okay, So that's 2% inflation. Now it gets to be confusing because the modeling by Tom Pavet and Nick Rockler for the minimum wage bill is done in 2017 dollars, okay, so you have to go back two years. And for your information here, I've converted all those numbers to 2019, today's dollars, okay. But I know that yesterday Deb Brighton was talking about 2018 dollars because she's done her work in 2018 dollars with the most recent data. So uh, that gets to be confusing. In the numbers that I show you today, I will be talking about $2019, today's dollars. But sometimes I have to think ahead. So for example, we're thinking about reaching $15 for the minimum wage in 2024. Okay, so that's what, five years into the future. So how do we know how many people will be affected by $15 an hour in 2024 in the distance, right? That's $15 an hour in future dollars, which are going to be worth less, OK? So if that $15 applied today, we have to subtract out all the inflation, and we get down to $13.43 or something like this, OK? Then we can look at how many people are paid $13.43 and below today to know how many people, how many workers 
might be affected in 2024 by $15 an hour. Okay, so time out. Yep. Um, John, can you scroll up so we can see the, that chart just above? Yeah, that's, that's good. Um, so to be clear, though, when you're adjusting these numbers, as you said, we're, we're using as still as the base. We had a big minimum wage study, pretty solid foundation in terms of in terms of what we were looking at, benefits, cliffs, um, other elements that now you're able to just plug in. I mean, you're using the same foundational work. Absolutely. So when we take more testimony on that foundational work, we're going to just sort of cross our eyes a little bit and, and not look at the numbers and then plug these numbers in. But the rest of the information in that report is still considered credible and up to date? For the most part, yes. I'm going to give you a little bit of an update on the literature, which will, I hope, get you thinking about implications of raising the minimum wage. Um, but for the most part, yeah, I mean, you can look at, at the figures that were in the previous reports and looking at, at the trends over time, the shape of the curve, and all that, all that is still absolutely re relevant. And so, and again, just to be, just to kind of point out the complexity of what you just were talking about. So based on the current law, 1204 and 2024, is up on that chart? Yes. As the normal inflationary Increase that 1204 is in real purchasing power is the same as 1050 was last year. Yes. So in essence, the a raise to fifteen dollars is a, a, a three dollar raise. Yes. From what would be expected at in 2024, not a four and a half dollar raise or whatever that. It, might be portrayed as, um, and then that $15 becomes the benchmark of $15 in 2024. Correct. Where is this 13, four, and so the 1343. <clears throat> okay, can I ask that we just hold off on that? Yes. I want to talk a little bit more about the, what we call current dollars, and current means in each year, right? Current in 2024 is $15 an hour. Current today is whatever it is, 1078, right? Whatever the year is, that, that sometimes that's, that's a confusing term, right? Current dollars. Uh, it, they're also called nominal dollars. So those are the dollars that apply in the year you're talking about. Okay. All right. So um, right. So so we've just talked about the fact that the difference in 2024 would be about three dollars, two dollars and ninety six cents uh, difference from current law. Um, if we stick with current minimum wage law, that minimum wage would be 1204, which is still <coughs> almost a dollar higher. So that's just taking care of the inflation effect. And then I've shown you a little picture just to show you uh, the minimum wage uh, current law and as proposed in nominal dollars. So you can see the blue line is the current law, and it's ramping up slowly, very slowly, right? The red line is S23, the proposed rise to $15 an hour in 2024. And you can see how that's rising a bit faster. Okay. So that's just to give you perspective on current dollars, current law versus S23. OK, now let's go to the next chart, which shows you the proposed minimum wage path adjusting for inflation. Right, so again, the reason why I like to think about it, adjusted for inflation, is that I can impose a different world on today's workers, right? By using today's dollars, inflation adjusted dollars. And this is exactly what they've done in the modeling effort to try to figure out how many people would be affected by the increase to $15 an hour given today's workforce, okay? All right. So you can see, uh, I've given you more history here, but um, you can see current law. Let's start with current law. So 1078 in 2019, and again, you can see if we go back in time, we get down to 915 in 2015. That's in uh, nominal dollars. 
if you go to uh, $15 in 2024, we're starting again at 1078 and getting to the $15. Okay, now I'm going to move to the right hand side of that table and look at inflation adjusted dollars. So this is as if a dollar today is adjusted for inflation to get the, the value in future years. Okay, so I've, I've shown you exactly how the current minimum wage law works, and that is it sticks with the current basis of 1078 going forward, okay? If I were showing you this in 2018 dollars, I'd be stuck at 1050, right? So now I'm stuck at 1078 using 2019 dollars. Uh, there we are under the $15 in 2024, the far right column, and you can see that the, the increases that get up to $15 in 2024 get up to $13.43. So that's what I was pre previously talking about. Okay. Are there any questions about that? You, uh, it might help also to look at that little chart at the bottom. So, you, so here the blue line is current law, and that's flat. That's stuck right at 1078. Okay. No change in that purchasing power. But if you look at current law, that is increasing to the $13.43 in today's dollars in 2019 dollars. At what point under current law um, is the magic number of 15 attained at what year? So I once knew that answer, but I cannot tell you the answer off the top of my head. I mean, it's probably around like 2027. Uh, What's the question? I'm sorry. What does it get? What, what, does, it get to, what does it get to 15 under current law on the inflation rate adjustment? Oh, it was 2032 or something right. like that. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, inflation rates have changed and they've probably come down, so it's probably even further out than that. Yeah, really? Because here. So you're looking at the uh, okay. S23 red line? No, I'm looking at the columns. So you want to be in oh. the far left hand. You want to yeah, have the yeah. number on the yeah. far left hand corner 24. So it would take, so you said 32, so it would take an additional eight years to get up three months? Probably. Well, let's see. It's gone, yeah, it's gone $1.50 in uh, what, six years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, it goes up a little bit more each year the the index right. yeah. okay. no that's what i was wondering but like for the index no, i think last year when we were talking about this it was it had come in at like 2032 2033 depending okay. on um depending on inflation but um yeah that's yeah it's an easy it's an easy calculation so i can get that to you no I mean, the ballpark's fine oh, and okay. that and that 15 of course would be the equivalent of well, yeah, you're working at 10, 10 50, and 20 yeah, the right. yeah, no, no, no. Right. I was just trying to do the math and for the like, nominal. Yeah, yeah. When do like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you hit that target? Number. Yeah, yeah. Representative Trump. So, ultimately, fifteen dollars by twenty twenty four is worth thirteen forty three. That's yes. what this is doing. Yes. Okay. Just want to make sure. Yes. That is right. Different. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, if we've taking care of all those questions on numbers. Yes. Just one more. Um, I don't know if you can make this, answer this briefly, but how are these projections, uh, inflation projections, uh, come about? Right. So there is a consensus economic forecast completed each year, actually twice a year, uh, by Tom Cabet and Nick Rockler okay. together with Jeff Carr, who represents the administration side of things. Yep. So it's a legislative mm -hmm. administration joint forecast yeah, okay. uh, that's presented to the legislature in early January each year. So um, that's the source of our Okay. Forecast. Thank you. Good. Could, could I ask it, uh, it, I think it's a more fundamental question. Why is the strategy to have in the first couple of years less of an increase and then it, it escalates? If I look on your previous page, why not just take the five years and prorate it? So, you would have to ask Senator Sorotkin, who is the sponsor of this bill. Okay. We have had various paths over the years. Uh, this is my third year doing minimum wage, I think. 
plus the summer study before that, so the fourth go round on minimum wage. We have, a, we have had a number of paths. Okay. Um, I would say that. Am I reading that correctly? Yes, you are, absolutely. Um, so there is a thought that this is going to be an adjustment for employers, and it might be better to start off a little bit more slowly in ramping up the increase. Um, there's also the idea that, that what you're looking at in the difference from current law is in nominal dollars. So as you adjust for inflation, that real change will be a little bit smaller going up farther. So that will shrink the difference over time. Uh, it's also true that the numbers under the $15 path are round numbers, right? So 1225, 1310, 1405, 15. At one point we had even Stephen increases and they were funny numbers, you know. 87 cents, and 04 cents, and whatever. So it was, that was another consideration. Okay, thank Don't. you. Good? Okay, now we can leave numbers behind for a little bit. Everyone brief sigh of relief, although numbers are the best part of time. Okay, so we can think about uh, what do minimum wage workers look like? and what do the jobs that pay minimum wage look like? And there was quite a lengthy description of all of this in the summer study that was done a few years back. I'm gonna give you some highlights that have been updated with more recent data. Okay. And if you're interested, that summer study um, is available on the web and I can provide that if you would like. If you could forward that to Ron sure. so that we can um, Include that in our. Yes, the link is on the JFO webpage and I will send that to you. Great, thank you. Uh, if you go to the JFO website, uh, you can search under subjects and it's under economy and then uh, labor or something like that. If you have trouble, don't poke me. Okay. So what are the characteristics of minimum wage jobs and workers? Okay, so for some of this analysis, I'm gonna focus on jobs that pay right around the minimum wage, so within 90% of the minimum wage. For most of it, I'm going to focus on any job that pays the minimum wage or below. Now there are some training programs for high school students, for example, that are allowed to pay significantly under the minimum wage for a set amount of time. Okay, so when you think about all the jobs that could be affected by a change in the minimum wage, we're including all those jobs. Okay, because presumably it's a it's a proportion of the minimum wage that's, that's paid to these high school students and training or whatever. Okay, so again, what we're using is the 13.43 and 2019 dollars. Okay, to look at the jobs out there in the economy that are paying minimum wage or less. So there are about 66,440. Vermont jobs that pay below the proposed minimum wage are about 21.8%, almost 22% of all Vermont jobs. Okay, that's a lot of jobs, but remember we're talking jobs, not people. Hold on a second. No, 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 I, no, 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 I'm just, that just, that number just blows my mind. I had no idea that there was that many, many part-time jobs, part-time jobs, um, internships, um, trainees, you know, long internships, I think we're to do that anymore. Uh, depends, it depends on the job. If you're work study, you don't have to be paid minimum wage, I believe. There are many, many rules. Yeah. That brings up another question um, about like grad students on stipends. Same thing. They're Same thing. They, in that. Yeah, if you look at their hourly right. wage, it's nowhere near right. that. By that in UVM or Champlain. anybody who has student work study jobs. I mean, they can pay, obviously, more than the minimum Absolutely. wage, but they have to pay the federal minimum wage at, at most levels, so. Federal minimum wage is $7.25. Right, and so the federal training wage, which you mentioned, is four and a quarter. Um, federal tip wage, as we know, which doesn't apply in Vermont, is 213. Our tip wage is five. Well, half of whatever. What it would stand out of that first bullet point is that the thirteen forty three, so fifteen dollars an hour in twenty twenty four, is the equivalent of thirteen forty three today, which is 
roughly the livable, the Vermont livable wage. Very close to the as, as, um, as that algorithm is determined by JFO. Yes. So by the basic needs budget. So yes. we are, $15 an hour would get us merely, I guess merely is not a right word, but it would get us to what today would be our livable wage, which we use for our calculations for pay family lead bill, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Exactly right. Okay, now, among minimum wage workers at 90% of today's minimum wage, so 90% of 1078, up to the new minimum wage, so these are people who are really working jobs that are not internships, not training programs, you know, not graduate students, for nothing. Mm -hmm. So these are people at minimum wage jobs. Um, among those folks, average hours worked per week about 35. Okay, so on average, these people are working full weeks. Average weeks worked per year is 44. So not quite 52 or 50 if you think about annual leave and so forth, or just vacation time off, but 44 weeks per year, so a substantial work year. Their average wage per hour is $11.51. Okay, so this is above the current minimum wage, but it means that there are lots of people in that band right up to 1343. Um, and the average annual income from the minimum wage job is twenty thousand dollars, two hundred eighty-two. So this this was in the twenty. The, this was in last year's. So this is an update from last year's. This is using a new um, American Community Survey for Vermont specifically. For Vermont specifically. So this is important because we, as a state in statute say a full-time job under the circumstance under minimum wage circumstances it's 40 hours a yes week. yes so when i just blithely throw off that minimum 15 dollars an hour is the equivalent of 32 i'm need to adjust that so this is average so remember right. it probably includes what Summertime work at the minimum wage for not head of household. We're actually we're going to talk about this. How many are head of households? Um, but there are many people who work minimum wage jobs who are not supporting a family, right? The people. Okay. So if we go to the next bullet, <laughs> forty-one percent of the workers in the minimum wage workforce are the head of a family. So either a single parent or a couple. Okay. So 41%, so we're at two-fifths of the people. And of those, turns out, also 41% provide o over half of the family income. So two-fifths of two-fifths is what? Four, uh, 20 fifths. And which is about 16%, right? Okay, so 16% of minimum wage workers provide over half of the family income. So we're talking about a much smaller piece of those minimum wage workers. Could you repeat that statistic, please? So I'm 16%. saying 16% of minimum wage workers are the head of the household and provide over half of the family okay. income. Yes. All right. All right, I'm getting a little 16. Go ahead. 16. 16. Yes. Yeah. Okay. My experience in, in horse farms and things is people come in and hook up the stalls for cash. And so I think that that's a pretty extensive number across the state. How, when you factor all this in, how do you factor in those people getting paid whatever, $10 an hour or whatever, which is? Yes, so these statistics come from the American Community Survey, mm -hmm. which is a nationwide <coughs> survey conducted by the Census Bureau, the US Census Bureau. Yeah. Um, so it includes um, a sample of Vermonters, yes. which is probably three or five percent, small, small numbers. Uh, these statistics are actually averaged over five years because Vermont is such a small state that if you looked at just one year's results, they would fluctuate a lot over time. Mm -hmm. But it's a good survey. I've actually taken the survey, and probably some of you have as well. 
Um, they try to get at cash payment as well as you know salary and so forth. Now it depends on how people report, right? If they're being honest and they report cash wages, then you'll see it. And if they don't report it, you won't see it. So um, yes, there is an underground economy, and, and everybody knows that it exists. We hope that that's included here. So uh, this 41 and 41 thing is running into the wall here. So 41% okay. of the workers in the minimum wage workforce are the head of a family. But only 41 of those, I mean, only 41 of those provide over half of the family income. Can you describe that family, those, can you describe that circumstance to me that only, so 16% of the people provide over half, but they're still the head of the family. Can you, how does that work? Sure, so think of all the people out there who are earning minimum wage. Um, Which is 21.8% of the population. Of all the jobs, to the jobs. To the jobs. Jobs, and remember that people who work low wage jobs tend to have more than one job. So right? that's, so, that's part so of the population is gonna in theory, be less than the 21.8%. Absolutely. Because they're working both. Maybe like it's 16%. Yeah. Who so. knows? Okay. Yes. So all the people out there working minimum wage jobs. Now, some of them are high school kids, summertime work. Some of them are college kids, summertime work. Uh, some of them are filling in before they start a real job, working a minimum wage job. Uh, there are lots of people in many different circumstances who are working minimum wage jobs. But what we often think about in the policy world in terms of is the minimum wage sufficient is if, no, scratch the if, for the people who are working a minimum wage job full time or close to full time to support themselves and their families, are they making enough to provide their basic needs? Okay, that's often the question. And among the people who are working within 90% of today's minimum wage up to $13.43, um, about two-fifths of those are the head of household. Okay, so these are people who need their income, obviously. They need every penny of their income. Um, and among those, some have spouses who are working other jobs that may be paying more, or they have rental income, or they have other income. Right, that is supporting their household. But of the heads of households who are earning minimum wage, two-fifths of those are providing over half of the family income. So anybody else who's working in the family is making, is just simply less, saying less than, less than them. But they can be a head of household and not be making more money, not making the most money in the family. Absolutely true. The head of household, unfortunately, is still defined as the husband, if there's a husband in the family. Defined by whom? Census Bureau. Well, that's an important point. <laughs> because don't we have another factoid coming up about, or a bullet point, at saying that X number of percentage of workers are women at the oh, population? Absolutely. absolutely. And many, many of these families are single parent families right, where the single parent is the woman and, and would be the head of household, mm -hmm. right? So, right. So yeah. head of household is the male. Generally speaking, it's the male. Well, by definition. That's the way they do things, unfortunately. We won't ask why. <laughs> I think you'd have to go back 50 years, right? Yeah, very possible. <laughs> yeah. Okay, all right. Yes. Um, no, this is an important update. Thank you for, I mean, I, I, I'm still. So these are Deb Brighton numbers. Um, and if there are more detailed questions, uh, I would funnel them through Deb, or she could talk to you about all this. She, she's done some really nice work. And all of this feeds into the modeling done by Tom Cavett and Rockler that we'll look at later for the Vermont economy. Yeah, Representative Zons. So, yeah, so I'm wrapping my head around this definition as well. Like. What makes this a meaningful statistic if, in other words, it would seem to me the meaningful statistic would be what percentage were primary earners in their household. If head of household is basically just a gender marker, 
that stat doesn't seem to be particularly meaningful. I'm going to check. I'm going to check to be sure I'm not uh, talking out of my hat. Mm -hmm. that an expression? No. But whatever the sure. expression is. Um, I will check. Because when you said that someone else in the household might make more money than them, then I'm, yeah, then that's why I'm confused to how, how they uh, head of household. If me, I'm, I'm just thinking primary. If I'm the head of my household, my wife would be surprised. Um, <laughs> first of all, um, but also from an income perspective, she's clearly always been the primary wage earner. So, you know, that's... Again, this is where this is, this is yeah. where this is where words matter, and right. trying to sort trying to sort this out. Um, but I would have I would have deferred to primary wage earner as as that. But if it is anyway, it this is just stuff that we need to know moving forward, so we don't. Um, Matt and then Tommy. Ah, I stand corrected. Oh. If the house is owned or rented jointly by a married couple, the householder may be either the husband or the wife. Beginning, oh, I'm, I'm way out of date. Beginning with the 1980 uh, CPS, which is the current population survey, the Bureau of the Census discontinued the use of the terms head of household. Oh, so I'm completely out of it. And head of family. Oh, wow, this is crazy. Okay. So the minimum wage should be $32 an hour. <laughs> 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 cool, I get charged 22 bucks for fresh toast now. <laughs> They use householder. Householder. Oh, okay. That's my name. And the householder refers to the person or one of the people in whose name the housing unit is owned or rented. Or if there is no such person, any adult member, excluding rumors, boarders, or paid employees. So how do they? Oh, ah. Uh, if the house is owned or rented jointly by a married couple, the householder may be either the husband or the wife. The person designated as the householder is the reference person to whom the relationship of all other household members, if any, is recorded. Huh. So that means we don't know. Oh, yeah. I mean, we don't so know. Is that the person you're talking for the statistical data? Is that they basically mean, what it means? Yeah. yeah it's okay. whoever, answered whoever answered the phone. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. That's bad. Yeah. So how does this relate to your 41% or 41%? Uh, yeah. 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 Right. So that means, uh, so I wonder if Deb defined it differently because she's using the head of a family as a single parent or couple. Okay, so I'll have to have a conversation. Is that an IRS head of household? Or is that, who's the, oh, that's, so a, sur reading, that's, that's a survey, a, right, right, that's a census, census one, right. Yeah, okay, so, so that's really interesting, I'm, and I had no idea. Trying to remember, Tom, I think uh, the last time we had this discussion, somebody did get the numbers of how many of these are single women. <clears throat> Yes, that 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 information that was in an infographic that yes. that was shared. I think it's, I think it's either in um, it may not be in the 189 page report, but it might be in some of the reports that came from um, the Boston Fed. Yeah, I don't so, remember what it was, but it was a significant number. So I need to say, be careful about that Boston Fed study. It should never have been published. Oh. It was based on one year of the American Community Survey looking at specific states, all the states in New England, and you should never, ever, ever believe the American Community Survey for one year for Vermont, because it's such a small state. Okay. And we, we received training from the Census Bureau on this, and they said, this is really bad. So um, I would put very wide margins around any of the results from that Boston Fed study. Yeah. Uh, Representative Gamash. So I would, I would think maybe um, on your tax return form, I, while I haven't looked at it this year, there are boxes that you check off in terms of, I'll use the term head of household. They don't use that term, but 
it's something similar to filer. Or yeah, I, I I don't recall exactly, but it is it establishes who you are in the household if you are the if you are the only income earner. Um, uh, you know, so perhaps that is what. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. That's not what's mm -mm. used. No, because the IRS has its forms that are not connected in any way to the forms filled out in the census. Right? So that would not serve as a guide, perhaps? A good I, I, guide? Well, what this says, filing? what the Census Bureau says is that it depends on who answers the survey, who fills out the survey. They are considered the head of household. I, I'm sorry, the householder. Yeah. It doesn't mean much. No. Well, it, right, so what I don't know is what definition Deb used yeah, because she had access yeah. to the raw data. Right. Uh, so I'm going to try to phrase this question so I'm not going to, it, it, because it is a policy question. In With Joint Fiscal Office, you deal with these kinds of reports all the time, and some of them are turned into infographics that you know you're just saying that this particular this particular piece of information that was put together is like the information isn't necessarily wrong it's just I mean I can go find those numbers but but what you're saying your experience or the way that you, when you see this particular study you say oh Vermont we need to average five in order to get a credible number so as we move forward, we are going to see a lot of these different infographics and we're going to see a lot of different things that have studies behind them or different groups behind them. Which, so which ones is not necessarily, you know, I'm, not, I'm trying to ask like which ones do we give weight to, but which ones do we find credible at its base level? So for instance, the, the survey that was released two years ago that was that this that was sponsored locally by the Commission on Women, the Vermont Commission on Women, which is a state agency, received funds to pay for a study that was done by a national group that blended numbers from across the country to come up with base numbers on the paid family leave policy. This is on the paid family leave policy, um, and then did some specific Vermont numbers. How do we how do we treat going forward? How do we treat any particular study? With, for credibility, because I think we're going to be baffled by a lot of numbers that are coming at us. And this, this was an example of, I mean, I just learned more in the last 10 minutes about how to, on one hand, the American Community Survey is good if you read it properly, but it's bad if the numbers are used improperly. And so that's kind of the Mark Twain lies, Dan lies of uh -huh. statistics. So where, from the JFO perspective, how do you, approach all these different things? How do you find that road to go on and say that this is better than this? So if you're a statistician, you look at the margin of error, which is statistically how wide is the confidence interval around a number. And if it's really wide, you want to be very careful about using a specific number. Right? Plus, or, plus, or, plus or minus. We see a political poll that's plus or minus 6%. Exactly. You're like, okay, so they, they pulled 12 people um, as opposed to point, you know, at 4%, they could have pulled 500 people. Right. Okay. Yes. Now, unfortunately, most of the time, policymakers don't want to be bothered with the uh, margin of error or the confidence interval. And so what they want is your best guess. And if you give your best guess, that's one number. And it's easier to absorb and think about, but it misses that uncertainty around the number. And so I think I asked this question last year about, again, probably a different subject, but when you had the box with the numbers of, of the CPI, of the estimated increases in the CPI that go out of five or seven years, can I pull up off the JFO website uh, or ask Tom Cavett or you to say, hey, what did Tom Cavett say 10 years ago? when it came to, in this case, something like inflation, which you can actually go back to. Because one, one of the things we do here is we say, in five years, it's going to be like this. Oh, this I ask this to the labor people. But in five years, it's going to be this. Well, what did we Look say five years ago, and what does it match up today? Yes. So we yes. can go back and say, five years ago, Tom Cavett said that the that inflation was going to be this, 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 and this. 
to your confidence factor, we can actually go back and say these were the actual numbers and get it at least get an idea that he was dead on or they were dead on and you know that, that the way that they use their numbers provided at least in this case an accurate number. I, I just no, it's a, it's a it's a good question and. Um, I can tell you when I worked at the Congressional Budget Office, we spent a lot of time, every five years maybe, going back 10 years before to look at our projections and to try to um, separate out the effects of policy changes, which of course could not have been predicted at the time that we made the, the projection, from uh, sort of technical changes, the way that the CPI gets measured and all those sorts of things, and then just what happened, right? And there's a big report that comes out from CBO every whatever, I think it's five or 10 years, that, that says, okay guys, we were off by this much, and we can explain so much from policy changes, we can explain so much from technical changes, and the rest, we just were wrong. So, it, it, it can be done, it takes a lot of work, um, but yeah, I mean, a simple thing to do would just be to look at Inflation projections from five years ago versus what actually happened. You would see but, a difference for sure. But again, you're you're creating that sense of of uncertainty of certainty because of the pol the potential for policy changes. I like. I mean, I've always wondered why doesn't the CPI change? You know, the measurements of certain things. Like even Dow Jones kicks people off the Dow Jones 30. So in this case, you're saying policy choices that we made can affect inflation rates or estimates or what have you. Um, okay, no, that's fine. I just, I, again, this is, we're in budget week, so we're getting a lot of numbers thrown at us, and I think that's where I'm coming from with a lot of these questions. Absolutely. Is that, is that Those are good questions. You yes. know, what do you trust, and what can you use as credible information when you're trying to push a policy forward? Right. Yes, and if I could take, uh, one minute to go off topic just a little bit. Uh, Deb Wrighton wanted me to be sure to talk about this. There is a study requested in S23 that would look at different measures of inflation yeah. for indexing the minimum wage going forward. And um, people don't always appreciate what's going on there. But the CPI is a fixed basket of goods, right? It's defined to be, you know, a household buys this, that, and the other, and those things stay pretty much fixed over time, except for big changes that are announced and da da da. Okay, the basket stays fixed. But there are other measures that move with people's choices of, of what is purchased. And the uh, personal consumption expenditure deflator, the PCE deflator, is now used by many, many organizations, the Federal Reserve Board, the Congressional Budget Office, um, many, many, you know, economic thinkers are now using the PCE deflator rather than the CPI because it is a better measure, a better measure of inflation because it moves with people's choices. Okay? So for example, think about phone service. You know, if you're still measuring the cost of a landline, um, you're not keeping pace with what many households are doing, which is dropping the landline and using the cell phone, right? So the PCE deflator takes that into account over time and probably creates a, a better measure for inflation. So uh, there is a study that's due in 2023 or something that would look at uh, different measures of inflation. Okay. All right. Side track. Okay. Uh, the number five. Yes, shall we move to new insights from the literature? Yes. How are we doing? Oh, you don't have much time. Okay. Yeah, and then, again, this is, we'll have you back, I'm sure, once or twice before the end of the year. <laughs> okay, there are some new faces on the committee. So let me just briefly say that over the past few years, there have been some discussions about what, what is found in the evidence about raising the minimum wage. Okay. So the question is, if you raise the minimum wage, do people lose jobs? Uh, who loses a job? Or do people lose hours of work? And who loses hours of work? And what's, what's the bottom line? You know, what's the effect on the economy? So just very briefly, in a nutshell, um, about two years ago, there was a, a very good uh, natural experiment, let's say, an experiment that happened in Seattle 
when they raised their minimum wage rather rapidly from, let's say it was about $9.50 an hour all the way up to $15 an hour. Okay? And so economists rushed, rushed in to see what would happen. And there were two groups, one from Berkeley, UC Berkeley, one from the University of Washington in, in uh, Seattle. And the UC Berkeley folks said, OK, we can do this. We can use data on food service workers. So waiters, waitresses, cooks, chefs, you, know, you name it, all, all those folks in food service. We can look at that bunch of workers. We can see what happens to the number of jobs and to the wages paid. Okay. They did their study. They've done many studies like this. They found no effect on jobs. They found uh, some increase in wages. Okay. People thought, great, this is good. This is you know, what the economics profession has been doing for years. Those are the results. Then along came the upstarts from the University of Washington. Uh, they were able to use individual data so they could follow individual people, workers, over time to know how many hours they were working and what their hourly wage was. And Washington is one of four states that collects data at that level. So hours worked and hourly wage. They found a, a drop in um, the minimum wage workers, the workers who were affected by the hike in the minimum wage. Not huge, but there was a drop. They also found a drop in the um, total uh, wages earned by those low wage workers because of the people who lost their job, right? The, the people who gained in minimum wage gained so much, but it was not enough to offset the, the wages lost of, of those who lost their jobs. Okay, so unfortunately, the paper that was written by these University of Washington upstarts has not gone through peer review yet, has not completed peer review, has not been published. Okay? So it's very easy for people to say, oh, but it hasn't been published, you can't believe it, you know, da, da, da. Okay, I don't know. I'm sort of agnostic. Uh, I do know that some of the top labor economists are really saying, you know, should we pay more attention to this University of Washington study? Uh, because it seems to be saying that there is some specific effect. And uh, what I'll talk about today is sort of the next step in both of those studies. Okay. Wasn't there also a case where those the authors of that study pulled back? Yes, and that's said, what I'm going to talk about. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so that was two years ago that those papers were published. Now, fast forward. Uh, recently, like in the last six months, two more papers have come out by the same sets of authors. Uh, we'll talk first about the University of Berkeley paper. So, they have a slightly different way of looking at this question now. They're looking at the number of new jobs paying at or slightly above the new minimum wage compared to the missing jobs paying below it. They looked so at I just want to make sure. Yeah, I'm the NDER paper? Yes, okay. absolutely. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> Sorry. There are two. I think it's the one above that you're talking about. Oh, you want the SEM key? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes, the top one. All right, thanks. Yes, they're both NDER papers. Sorry. Um, Okay, so they're looking at many different uh, sites across the country where the minimum wage changed. And they're trying to think about how many new wages came in around the new minimum wage compared to how many jobs were lost around the, the minimum wage. Okay, so they looked at many, many years, 1979 to 2016, thinking about that, that balance. And they found that the overall number of those low wage jobs around the minimum wage remained about the same five years after the increase in the minimum wage. So this would support the view that yes, there's churn, right? People are changing jobs, coming, moving in and out of jobs. But that the, about the same number of jobs existed close to the minimum wage as it moved up over time, okay? So, if you, well, okay, so I'll just, I'll just leave it there. And then the final bullet says um, they find some evidence of reduced employment in tradable sectors. So that means if you have something that's made in uh, China and you're raising the minimum wage in that industry, then it's likely that 
jobs will be lost in that industry in the U.S. because you can import things more cheaply from China. Okay, so that's the tradable sector. Which could be anything in manufacturing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And is already happening. And, and we've seen it happening happen. for Absolutely. many months. Absolutely. And, it, and exacerbated by tariffs, which that's mostly in with China. Okay, so that's sort of the traditional what we think about the minimum wage, right? No big loss in jobs, no big loss in, in wages and so forth. Okay, now we come to the upstarts, and the upstarts have released a new paper as well. And um, so again, the, the difference here is that they're able to use data on individual workers and follow them through time. Uh, and so they find that, well, okay, so this is what I said before. On net, the minimum wage increase went from 9.47 up to $13 per hour and it raised earnings by an average of $8 to $12 per week. Now, this is a little bit different from their earlier results, okay? Previously, they were saying that people lost some dollars per week. Now they're finding that, in fact, if you're careful about your analysis, uh, you find this small gain. Um, okay, but all of the gains accrued to workers with above median experience when the minimum wage increase started at baseline, okay? So the folks who had been working for a while were seen as being worthy of the minimum wage increase, right? They were productive enough to warrant the increase in the minimum wage, but the less experienced workers weren't producing that much, and so they saw no significant change to weekly pay, meaning they might have lost some hours. Okay? So you're going to... If you have to pay everybody more, you're going to use more of the hours of people who are producing more and less of the hours of people who are less productive. Is that, a, is that a, an exchange for wage compression? So wage compression usually refers to what happens to wages above the minimum wage. And here we're talking about weekly take-home pay. So it's a slightly different concept. Yeah, I'm just thinking, again, there's uh, people are concerned if you have experience and if minimum wage is twelve dollars and I'm making fourteen dollars an hour or if I'm making fifteen dollars an hour shouldn't I be getting seventeen dollars an hour but this isn't this isn't measuring that it's measuring people at the minimum wage yes. who are productive yes. before they get raises if right. they what because raises aren't happening at that level whatever so right. okay that's, no, that's good yeah Yes. I think that's like the next that wasn't yeah. the conversation. <laughs> Sorry. 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 People aren't doing the next impression. Okay, and about a quarter of the <coughs> earnings gains can be attributed to experienced workers working outside of the Seattle city limits. Okay, so maybe these folks at the minimum wage maintained the same number of hours at their current job, but they also went outside the city where they were paid a bit less but could get more hours of work. Okay, so they increased their, their take-home pay, but they did so by increasing hours of work outside of where the new minimum wage was effective. Okay. We're going to run out of time, so. Yes. Yeah, Can I? Uh, so this last bullet, yeah, I no, think, that, really That's the key. Yeah, I think that's really important. So, right, yeah, John, if you could scroll that up. So there we are. So the authors associate the minimum wage ordinance with an 8% reduction in job turnover rates, which is a good thing, right? Employers keep their employees longer. But also a significant reduction in the rate of new entries into the workforce. So by raising the minimum wage, you're making it a little bit harder for employers to take on an inexperienced workforce, right? It's just a little but bit because, harder. But because the more experienced people aren't leaving at a, high, at a lower rate. Yes. So there are fewer openings. Fewer openings. Yeah. Well, except if you're right out of high school, right. no education, you're not looking for a job. You're not, first you're not, yeah, yes. you're, not, you're probably not as. Right. So it just tells me. a raw individual. And there were other questions with the Seattle study as well that, again, we can, we can see what we want to see and hear what we want to hear from those as well. Yes. And uh, we'll go into these. So the last check, the last section that we did not get to talks about the modeling. Yes. And we can read that because I think we'll have a little bit of free time on the floor today. Just 
at some point, if you feel like you know you can fit in a few minutes to read, I think there's probably going to be a little bit of time to do that. Um, sometime between now and 10 o'clock tonight. So, committee, just very quickly, I just wanted to let you know if I have. You know, so, so Representative Gonzalez has been out, and um, her partner is pregnant and is having issues with her, with his pregnancy. So, it's just a question of um, she, Deanna's with Ace and has been with Ace. So, um, just keep them in your thoughts and. We don't, I don't know anything more than that, but tough, tough times. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. 